Got a lot of contracts. Wow. All right. Everybody's in a jovial mood, I suppose. Not yet. Let me, <laughs> I'll call the meeting to order. So today is December 1st, Wednesday. I know we have a lot. December 1st, we're here on Education, Environment, and Sustainability Committee meeting and want to have a roll call, but wanted everybody to know we have a new committee member, um, new Councilwoman Meredith Turner. We're very pleased to have her on this committee. She has a lot of experience and interest in education in particular and a big asset to the county as well as to this committee. So welcome. And we will go with a roll call. And just as a reminder to all who are in attendance, this meeting is being recorded and live streamed on the county's YouTube page. Uh, calling the roll, Ms. Simon? Here. Ms. Turner? Here. Mr. Jones? Mr. Jones is absent at the moment. Mr. Shrine? Here. Ms. Stevens? Present. There is a quorum. Thank you. Um, any public comment? No, Madam Chair, no one has signed in. Thank you so much. We do have minutes from September 22nd and ask that we have a motion to approve. So I move, move that we approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, so these minutes are approved from September and we're gonna move forward now with a series of contracts from um, Invest in Children and um, directors here to talk about each one. And believe it or not, we're here every two years to um, look at these and, and it goes fast. Resolution number 2021-0274, authorizing a contract with Child Care Resource Center of Cuyahoga County doing business as starting point in the amount not to exceed $1,620,682 for implementation and management of the Child Care Access and Quality Expansion Program. Thank you. Rebecca Dorman, Invest in Children, County Office of Early Childhood. Um, so we have six items on the agenda today, which I believe is a record for us. Um, before I dive into the details of the items, I just wanted to briefly state that Invest in Children in collaboration with our lead agencies who are also represented here um, and many community agency subcontractors have spent nearly two years now continuing to implement our programs and serve children and families during the pandemic. I'm really proud to say that we still have an intact early childhood system. It looks a little different, but it's still operating and serving children and families. Um, as we begin our 23rd year, we continue to mobilize resources and research to ensure the well-being of all young children in Cuyahoga County. We provide a continuum of targeted services, prenatal to kindergarten, for children and their families. We're working to achieve equity and access to services and eliminate racial and ethnic disparities in child and family outcomes. All of the contracts which you will um, hear about today are central to supporting those goals. And um, so as we go through, I'll just um, like to introduce the, the agency. So first, um, first, I wanna say I'm really proud also of the team at Invest in Children who worked so hard along with the team at DCAP here at the county in collaboration with the lead agencies to get these contracts to you on time. And we're real, as you know, there are many hoops to go through to get contracts in on time and um, especially now. So I'm very proud of the team that we are here um, in a timely fashion. So the first item for your consideration is the starting point contract um, that was mentioned and just recognize that I have Nancy Mendez and Kira Porter here representing Starting Point so they can, of course, answer any questions if I'm unable to uh, do so satisfactorily. Um, Starting Point is the state designated child care resource and referral agency for a four county region, including our county. They become designated through an RFP process that the state um, does every uh, several years. In this role, they support both families searching for childcare as well as help establish new childcare centers and as well as provide training and technical assistance to existing centers to maintain and improve quality. This work has never been more important as we know that the childcare system is at a very precarious moment with many, many professionals leaving the field for a variety of reasons. I am happy to say that currently there are 531 licensed centers in Cuyahoga County of these centers, 364 accept public funding, meaning that the children who qualify because their families are considered low-income working families and qualify for the child care subsidy, 
that um, there are 364 of those publicly funded and 57% of those are highly rated in the state rating system called Step Up to Quality. Looking back two years, though, we did lose 14 centers um, who serve families on subsidy. Um, however, on the bright side, I'll keep trying to do bright side, we added 37 who were high quality. So of the, of the centers that we have now, the, actually the percentage that are high quality who serve publicly funded children has actually gone up. So we haven't lost many centers, but we have a lot of closed classrooms. So I, it's a glass half full uh, kind of pictures and we're very concerned about that. Um, so this, um, this contract um, does provide um, support to all of the current uh, centers in the county. Um, starting point also maintains the database on centers, um, keeps um, us up to date on capacity. Um, they also manage the scholarship fund that families throughout the county are able to apply for and also manage scholarships for childcare providers who would like to pursue further education and get their BA degree. And that's all part of this uh, contract and happy to tell you more or take your questions. Okay, questions from the committee members? I just have a quick question sure. which might permeate all these contracts, the closed ca classrooms, the challenges, is that just trying to bounce back after COVID? What is happening yeah. um, with, with childcare? Yeah. And we hear a lot about that and what's happened? Um, we think it's several factors, all like perfect storm. Um, one factor is <clears throat> that, provide, that staff are leaving to get higher paid jobs going to Amazon, et cetera, where you can make, we know how underpaid our childcare staff are and you can just make more money elsewhere. Um, some of it we think might be some vaccine mandates. For example, Catholic Charities, I just heard who's um, instituted a vaccine mandate for staff is losing about five teachers because of that. So that's another issue. Um, is there demand from kids um, and families? I think that's a mixed picture, but we do know that our Head Start, our largest Head Start provider, which is also a UPK provider at Step Forward, right now has 16 classrooms that are closed. I think it's a mixture of the staff issue and demand is down also. So I think it's, there's a lot going on. So the demand's connected just to the underemployment. It's um, um, you situation. know it's it's chicken and egg. You have to have the staff to open the classroom and then attract the kids. And it, so if the kids don't come, you can't put in the staff. And if the staff don't come, you can't put in the kids. And it it I think it's a um, all of those factors together. And I'm if if, if Nancy do you, or Kara do you want to is that am I representing it correctly? Would you say yes, you are. okay? It's a strange time. So hopefully yeah. this will work itself out in the next 12 months. Okay, Councilman Tron. Yeah, Madam Chairman, just be, you know, based on your, your picking up on that, uh, I was gonna wait till we got a little later on, but maybe we could run this thread all the way through. Is there, uh, what, what happens in anything else? If, there, if it was any other business, which is, this is a business too, there's consolidation when you get to a point when um, you have excess supply, i.e. classes uh, and, uh, not enough demand. Is there uh, any opportunities to do any consolidation of any of these programs, at least temporarily, if nothing else, uh, for six months, twelve months, anything of that nature, to to uh, to try and get some economies of scale? I don't think so. I I think it's it, and I I think it varies by the type of program, what's going on. So, for example, Horizon, which is a private for profit, uh, private nonprofit agency that has multiple sites, they have 400 kids on the waiting list because they don't have staff. So, they have the, the kids without the staff. And, you know, I don't, what's going on with staffing is people are going from center to center and there, there is competition to attract a staff person. So we are looking at how we can um, help stabilize staff within each center. But once that, once you consolidate, I think it's hard to go back to the old system and eventually we'll need to. So 
Yeah, it, it, it's, it's hard to go backwards once you've done that, but by yeah. the same token, it's almost like the Great Cleveland Partnership when they merged uh, support organizations came together as a single body at the end. Um, it, it found to be yeah. probably well, an effective way of of, of uh, bringing together. And sometimes when uh, when you get in challenges of this nature, you might find that it creates a whole new creative solution out there. And so you might be surprised at, at what creative things people can do uh, out there. Yeah. I mean, our hope is that the demand will go up to where it used to be. I know um, Cleveland Schools is also very under-enrolled, and there it's clearly about families not sending kids because they would have the staff. So I, it's, I think it's sort of different pockets have different, uh, array, different sets of factors become more or less important. So I, I think the market, you could say, could maybe take care of itself. The, one of the biggest issues is parents can't afford to pay more. And so you can't afford to pay staff more to make them stay or help them have a reason to stay. So we'll see. I know um, Councilman Miller always asks me what's going on with the federal legislation. And that's the big unknown. If there will be a big infusion of dollars into the system that will stabilize, stabilize it on the uh, staff side of it. And then you have to convince the kids to come, come in. So I don't know, Councilman Schron, it's a good, it's a, it's a good question. It's a different kind of market, I think, than... And, and um, we, we, we subscribe a lot to some of the stuff that Disney does. Uh, when they have a problem of a nature of this nature, they go out and say, well, what if we... And then they fill in the blank with a whole series of what ifs, if we tried this, what if we tried that? And you sometimes find unique solutions uh, if you are not constrained by your, by your old thought. And you say, okay, what would we want this to look like in the future? And you might find we could end up with a exciting new opportunity that presents itself in a lot of respects. So I, uh, I well, don't. along that line, I will say that um, the Department of Development, which has never really in, at the county, which has never been in this space, and um, we have been talking with them, and we're um, looking at what can we do around the workforce issue and to potentially reach out to the private sector to help us think that through from the standpoint of we have a problem with the child care workforce, but then there's the workforce everywhere else who needs the child care. Because so, we have the same problem. <laughs> right. So we need to talk. So we're, we have a meeting this week to talk about maybe have an event, like a small round table to discuss the issues. Like I think sort of along the lines of what you're saying, we need new partnerships to look at the issue and try to solve it together. Because hopefully everyone sees how important child care is now. Well, and, and sometimes you might grab folks from completely unrelated activities uh, that uh, you wouldn't even think would fit into it. Uh, so, so don't be afraid of, of grabbing across uh, other lines, talk to medical, talk to manufacturing, talk to, you know, not because they have the answer to your solution, but they're, they're, sometimes their creative ideas can come. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, so I'm gonna ask this committee if they'll consider a passage of this on second reading suspension, all of these contracts, because we, for the first time, I think, have yeah. had everything, which is amazing, um, effective one one twenty two, and we only have one more council meeting before that space. So if that's okay, I'm gonna, if there's no other questions, move this, um, make a motion to move this resolution with recommendation of passage at the next full council meeting with a recommendation for um, second reading. Um, Ron, second. Yes, thank you. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, thank so thank, thank you, you very much. Um, next one, can we read 0275? Resolution number 2021-0275, authorizing a contract with Child Care Resource Center of Cuyahoga County, doing business as starting point in the amount not to exceed $2,708,844 for management and administration of the Family Child Care Home Professional Development System. Okay. Again, Rebecca Dorman from Invest in Children and the Office of Early Childhood. So um, a very important um, component of the child care system in our community are our licensed family child care homes. So we have, um, there, there are type B homes, which um, can accommodate up to six children, and there are type A homes, which, which can have up to 12 children. And this really has been, because these are small groups during, especially the shutdown of the bigger centers and the shrinking of classrooms, they really were the backbone of the system during the early days of that uh, time period. Currently, we have 384 type Bs operating, that's with the six kids, and 28 type As. 
Um, it's down slightly. It's a reduction of 28 uh, licensed homes from uh, two years ago. So not a huge reduction, um, but somewhat. Um, so the, the purpose of this, similar to the uh, contract that I just presented, is to provide training, technical assistance, support to these providers to help them uh, become providers, first of all, um, to maintain quality, to improve quality in the system, um, to facilitate health and safety practices for um, licensing compliance, and um, to, in general, um, maintain the system. Um, this system serves um, close to 3,000 children, so it is a big part of our ecosystem in the child care world. Um, so I'll pause there for questions. Any questions? Okay. Same motion. Same second. Okay. <laughs> we'll visit the full council meeting with a recommendation of passage under second reading. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, next item. Resolution number 2021-0276, authorizing a contract with Child Care Resource Center of Cuyahoga County, doing business as starting point in the amount not to exceed $4,442,092 for special needs child care program. Again, Rebecca Dorman, County Office of Early Childhood Invest in Children. Um, this is a slightly different role that Starting Point plays. Um, this contract and program is to support children with special needs, be it medical, developmental, or behavioral, and most, most of the issues that deal with our behavioral help them um, maintain in uh, the child care setting in which they've uh, which they are, have been uh, have enrolled. So um, this is um, crucial because we know so many children in child care do come with uh, special needs, especially kids with, with significant trauma, et cetera. Child care providers are not often ready and able to accommodate some of those needs. So starting point is our central intake. Um, we have eight contractors. They have eight subcontractors, uh, community agencies, including also the Board of Health, um, if it's a medical issue. Um, and they will deploy the agency, the appropriate agency, to work with the provider to help them. And so it's, it's aimed at the adults. It's aimed at the staff in the center to be able to work with and accommodate um, and meet the child's needs. Um, they also will link uh, families who will call starting point to find the, an appropriate setting for a child that has a special need. Um, and um, I mean, that it's essentially, um, that's sort of it in a nutshell. The target goal is around about 1,100 children per year who are served with the technical assistance in the center. Service coordination, helping link families to other resources is approximately 300 children. Um, and several years ago, we heard from providers that there were just some really deep end kids that they needed even more help. And um, so we developed with starting point a model of intensive uh, special needs, and we have private funding for that. You might notice a little bit of, of private funding um, is there, and that's to serve 200 children who have really severe needs, and they get more intensive uh, support from um, that, the agency that's assigned to them. So I will pause for questions. Any questions? Councilman yeah, Trump. Yeah, Rebecca, uh, what, what's the age you, you handle in this group? In this? Well, it, typically it'll be preschoolers. It could be you know, even toddlers, but it's typically when the, um, so maybe with medical or developmental issues, you might see it skew younger, but when kids start to, and it's usually aggression, obviously, that is the um, thing that will get you kicked out of a childcare facility the fastest. Um, so it's more uh, preschool age kids. Okay, right. thank you. Uh -huh. With no other questions, I'll make that same motion that this matter be, um, forwarded to our next full council meeting with a recommendation of passage under second reading suspension. Drawn second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Next item, 0277. Resolution number 2021-0277, authorizing a contract with Educational Service Center of Northeast Ohio in the amount not to exceed $1,357,008 for fiscal agent and administrative services in connection with Bright Beginning System. Rebecca Dorman again, and I want to also recognize we have Karen Mincer, 
who's the as executive director of Bright Beginnings. So um, we're really excited about this um, creation within uh, Bright Beginnings um, of a parent support department, which is going to add to the continuum of services that um, is offered under the Invest in Children banner through uh, Bright Beginnings. Um, so in the past, just to remind you, we've funded Bright Beginnings to do uh, the home visiting program called Parents as Teachers. Because of their ability to access uh, state dollars and the other agencies that they used to fund, well, actually through us, um, to access state dollars, um, Bright Beginnings has reconfigured how and added to the service continuum in the following way. So there will be three program models. Um, one is um, expanding on a current uh, program called Parents Connect, which is a curated Facebook group that um, we now have 300 to 400 families um, who are regulars, but we will they will expand, we, we hope, to 1,000 families and expand the eligibility. So it has been in the past a closed group uh, for home visited families, but this will be advertised and we will let other families of young children now be part of Parents Connect. The Triple P Parenting Program, which is an evidence-based model, um, will provide group support both in person and virtually. And again, add a group component to our service system. And then a pilot program working with families where the child, uh, preschool child has an elevated lead level to provide ongoing support to the family, connect them to resources, et cetera. And also um, to make sure that fatherhood services are infused across the continuum in all these programs, they will be convening a parent support advisory committee to help um, as this new department gets off the ground and it will have parents, uh, representatives from local agencies and other community partners who will be part of it. So um, we're really excited about thinking in new ways and Bright Beginnings has been great in showing the initiative and bringing this forward to expand the continuum. So I'll pause for questions. Any questions? I just have a quick question on yeah. the, the lead. Um, yep. Kids, children with elevated blood, lead in their blood, who's handling, I thought we had the Department Board of Health and all these other agencies that would assist with that. Is this just a more granular um, attention given to the to the needs of the kids or how is this different Much than more. what's happening now? So, uh, well, let me start with a few years ago, um, actually uh, Bright Beginnings Invest in Children and Other Partners led an advocacy uh, campaign to um, get rules changed at the state level for early intervention eligibility. So that covers kids zero to three with elevated lead and um, Bright Beginnings actually does the case management for that, for our community in coordination with the Board of DD, who's the regular provider of um, early intervention services. But you're, that those services, which are very focused on the child's needs, um, if there are any deficits, as well as the family, they end at age three. And the Board of Health is um, helpful in doing some case management, but this is a much more intensive model of really working with a family, seeing if the child has uh, needs beyond what the Board of Health has been able to, uh, either of the health departments have been able to do. Are the numbers of children with lead exposure going up, going down, stable? I mean, we're putting a lot of money now right. into programming um, and abatement. I, right now, I think there we haven't seen a huge drop that I'm aware of. Um, part of the issue, though, is you only will know if things are up or down if kids get tested. And what we do know is that those numbers have gone down during the pandemic, immunizations have gone down. So the first thing we need to do is ensure that we find the kids who, who need the assistance by getting them tested. So there's a lot of work going on to look at models to make sure that kids do get screened and tested in a timely fashion. And then we'll have a better sense of how things have gone with all of the money that's gone into abatement. Good Hopefully question. Hopefully we'll see some reduction. We'll hope. Without any... We want to put ourselves out of business on that one. Yeah. On that one. 
For okay, sure. so if there's no further questions, I'll make that same motion for bright beginnings here that we move this uh, resolution to the next full council meeting with a recommendation of passage under second reading suspension. Second. We're on second. All in favor, aye. Aye. Okay, next item, please. Resolution number 2021-0278, authorizing a contract with Cuyahoga County Board of Health, <clears throat> excuse me, in the amount not to exceed $1,539,300 for program administration services for the newborn home visiting program. Rebecca Dorman again, and I want to recognize uh, Ramona Brazil and Amy Geis who are here from the Board of Health and have been just a little busy over the past two years. You may have seen Ramona has done many of the updates um, with the executive and with Terry Allen, our health commissioner. Um, we are um, very pleased that um, because there was a pause in this program during the pandemic, but um, it is back up and running and has um, is now expanding um, to um, Hillcrest and uh, Fairview hospitals from um, for the past decade or so. We've been in the two major birthing hospitals, which is um, Metro and UH, but we are now um, expanding the program. They'll be expanding the program to the other two major birthing hospitals. And so the nearly the all Medicaid births then occur in those four hospitals and they will be able to do the child find there and offer the program to many more families. Um, the program's goal, it's a one-time nurse home visit by a public health nurse from the Board of Health. Um, they will do a complete head-to-toe medical exam of the baby. They will also look um, at the health of the mom. They do a safety check of the home, um, screen for maternal depression, share resources, make referrals as needed um, if, if there's a, a need for um, ongoing services, home visiting, et cetera. Um, and we'll do a follow-up call again if needed to check on the mom. We've had some, um, uh, they will an and answer questions, et cetera. And um, the agreement rate in the hospital for eligible moms is really high. 98% of the moms who are approached in the hospital agree to having the home visit. Um, there's some drop off after that, but um, overall it's, it's a very um, well-received program and um, many medical problems have been identified um, and some in the mom, some in the baby. Um, very high blood pressure in the mom comes to mind where she didn't realize how high it was or the risk to herself, her stroke, et cetera. So it's, even though it's one visit, it comes at a very crucial moment. And um, I think it's really an important, important program. Um, with this, with the county dollars that they'll be receiving, they will conduct a minimum of 2,100 visits um, per year. Fantastic, thanks. Questions? I will say that people who have this visit love it. I mean, yeah. I only get really positive feedback good. from this program. Oh, good. It's awesome. Good. Okay, thank you. Um, make the same motion to move this resolution to the next full Second. council with the recommendation of passage under suspension. Second, Shron. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Um, finally, um, I think one more, right? Two, oh, 0279? Yeah. Resolution number 2021-0279, authorizing a contract with City of Cleveland Department of Public Health and the amount not to exceed $682,276 for prenatal and interconceptional care services to high-risk families in connection with the expansion of the Moms First program. Okay, um, once more, Rebecca Dorman. Um, the Moms First program from the Cleveland Department of Public Health has been um, a, a, in our community for over 25 years. Um, Lisa from the Department of Health is here to represent the program. Um, it is a um, maternal focused um, program in the city of Cleveland with some element of including dads as well now. Um, for eight of the past 10 years, the infant mortality rate for the mom's first participants has been below the rate for Cuyahoga County even though they serve the most um, at-risk population. So again, moms in the city of Cleveland, um, very specific goal of eliminating the um, mortality uh, disparity uh, between black and white infants in our community. It also assists with um, referrals 
for insurance, for housing, for food, for education. And community health workers um, do the home visiting. Um, so it's um, a slightly different model in that it's um, there very uh, really uh, has worked well. And there's very good word of mouth from mom to mom in the neighborhoods about getting a, a mom's first worker, I would say. So um, I will, and, and it goes until the baby's 18 months of age. Thank you. Questions? Okay, so I'm gonna make the same motion to move 0279 to the next full council meeting with a recommendation of passage under suspension. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you so much. And I do wanna point out that all six of these contracts are funded through the county with our um, HHS levy, except there's a few grants that um, right. the director spoke of on I think two of the items, Mount yes, Sinai. Sorry, one Cleveland Finition, one Mount Sinai, a little bit. So of money, this but. is how our HHS dollars are being put to use, oh. and I think it's you know really smart and um, long-term planning for our county. So I appreciate Thank you, you getting all these contracts in. It's a Herculean task. And well, I want to recognize everybody. the staff who are here. Who so um, Shauna Rorman, who's our new associate director, took over from Bob. Bob, who's new Bob. Okay. happy in retirement. Yep. Um, Alyssa Swiatek, who's our family engagement manager, and John Ladd, who's a program officer. And um, right now we've had some changes in um, staffing. Um, we're down three staff now. We're in the midst of hiring. So everyone's sort of taken on a, a bigger role with programming, and they've all been awesome in, in making sure that we get through. And I want to recognize Paul Porter, where is he? Way in the back. And his staff, who we work very closely with. He now has a couple of staff who used to be at Invest in Children have gone over there. So it's a good collaboration. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Thank and you. hopefully you'll be staff, fully staffed again. So with We're the, hoping. Yep. Okay. We're trying. Thank you. Thank Money's you. there, right? It's just finding the person. The money is there. Yeah. I okay. need the people. Okay. Yeah. need the people. Madam Chair, thank you so much. Move um, on. Yes, Councilwoman um, Stephen. Well, I don't think anybody should take my silence in just voting for these things um, as a lack of interest. Um, what you do is incredibly important to many of us. Um, and it's unfortunate that everyone isn't here to tell you and your team, thank you for the work that you oh. do for the littlest of us who don't get to vote and who need our, the safety net that county government provides to them the most. Um, this work is crucial because, for example, if you are exposed to lead and you're under five years of age, that could be detrimental for the rest of your life. It could handicap you from learning correctly, from your body from growing correctly, depending on the depth of the exposure. Um, having good child care um, while a parent goes to work is incredibly important. So all the work that you do ensures the future of this county. So thank you for making sure we have a future with people who don't have enough money to seek the services that you provide all on their own. On behalf of Invest in Children and all of the lead agencies, we appreciate that very, very much. Thanks, everybody. Yep. Okay, keep up the work. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Yep. We have one more contract. We'll be back in January. Okay. Bye. Okay, so we're moving on to an, another important and interesting um, program. It, can we have a reading on 0281? Resolution number 2021-0281 making an award on requisition number 5807 to Cuyahoga County Public Library in the amount not to exceed $560,000 to oversee and administer the Cuyahoga County Sheriff's Adult Basic Education Program. Afternoon. Hello. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hello. Afternoon, committee members. Paul Porter, Health and Human Services, Division of Contract Administration and Performance, here on behalf of the county's Office of Reentry for this item for adult basic education services to be delivered in the county jail. We are recommending an award on an RFP that was issued earlier this year, of which the Cuyahoga County Public Library was one of three respondents. They were the highest scoring respondent when we reviewed those proposals. And this is for services that are delivered in the county jail to inmates that include adult basic education as well as GED preparation 
so that when those inmates are released from jail, they can have an easier transition back into the community. As you know, jobs today look for any number of education requirements, including at a bare minimum, a GED for that high school diploma equivalency. Mm -hmm. This is a three-year contract and a little bit. So this one's gonna be effective upon approval. And again, Councilwoman Simon, you referred the preceding contracts for approval under second reading suspension. We would ask for the same consideration for this contract because it's designed to have an upfront payment to get the program off and running at the end of this year. And then the program would be in effect until 1231 of 2024, at which time we would likely look to do an RFP for these services sometime in the first quarter of calendar year 2024 so that we could bring a new contract back to you. I understand that these services had been interrupted due to the pandemic. It is essential that we get the library back into the jail working with these individuals. I'm joined by Simeon Best, for the new director of our Office of Reentry, as well as Fred Bulletin. And then we do have a representative uh, from the library, Jamie Harris, who is here. So I'm happy to turn it over for any programmatic questions. I'm happy to address any contract specific questions you guys might have. Sure, any questions from committee? Councilwoman Stevens and I'd then like Tron. to hear from uh, uh, the representative about exactly how the program is gonna work because it's been over a year since I've heard about it. We'll get them up for that, but your issue is, prog is not programming, just the contracts. Just the contracts and you send yes. it out to bid and then this is, do we Absolutely. have other bidders beside the library? We did have two other bidders. Hold on a second. Let me look at my notes. Tri-C submitted a bid as well as Seeds of Literacy. And again, the library score was the highest out of those three. When we review proposals under an RFP, we don't only look at the cost of delivering the services. The proposal is scored based on the merits of the responses to every single question the budget only represents a small piece of that score. Councilman Schron. Was there any uh, any bidding from the program that's being referred to as access uh, here in town? I am not sure. I believe that just those three bidders, the library, Tri-C, and Seeds of Literacy. So we didn't have a bid from a different agency other than that. Okay, because the access program is, is the one that's delivering the services through the sector partnership for those uh, individuals coming out of incarceration uh, into the manufacturing sector first, sure. and then they're going into, hopefully, into the medical sector, and someday maybe even IT as they as they get st stood up on the sector partnership, and then ultimately the last one, which is now being stood up uh, probably in the next six months, will be the hospitality sector. So sure. please keep a uh, link, uh, because uh, there's a ready um, desire to hire uh, these individuals coming out of incarceration, and if they can get some background, the access program is 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 uh, is getting phenomenal success, and I think it, it's got a piece of that services being provided also by Tri C. Perfect. It Thank sounds you. like that would be a good opportunity for future collaboration, and we can make sure when this is sent out as an RFP that the necessary stakeholders at that organization are included on the list when this goes out, so that they could submit a response in the future. The problem is the same as Ms. Dorman was talking about, is that there's so many individuals coming out of these programs, uh, there just is not enough uh, enough individuals, actually. They're, they're all being hired almost immediately upon coming out of the programs. That makes good sense. And hopefully, again, by ramping this program back up, we'll be able to get more people out into the community and into those good-paying jobs. The, the job is the great social welfare program. Okay, thank you so much. So uh, Councilwoman Stevens had um, questions about the actual programming itself, Perfect. and so... I'll turn it over to Director Best Director. in that case. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Good afternoon, Good afternoon gentlemen. Madam Chair and Council. Simeon Best, Director of the Office of Reentry, and to answer Councilwoman's uh, question, we have built into the contract some alternatives because we know that the the jail had not allowed, um, you know, contractors outside of the jail to come in and do that work. So I want Jamie Harris to come, and she is from Aspire, the, the library program, to kind of speak to what those alternatives are. 
Excellent. Thank you, Simeon. Um, so this is, I'm Jamie Harris. I am the Corrections Specialist of Adult Education at the Cuyahoga County Public Library. Um, so during the COVID pandemic, when the jails were closed to all programming, specifically to our adult education program, we expanded the programs that we did to the McDonald Center, the community-based correctional facility, um, as well as the North, <coughs> excuse me, the North Star Neighborhood Reentry Center. Um, and then the work that we do at Lutheran Metropolitan Ministries um, with the work that they do at the women's prison here in Cleveland. Um, we were able to expand all programming at those locations to make sure that the inmates that were being released out of the jails during the, the start of the pandemic still were able to access our programming. So moving forward, we're gonna continue to do that good work. Hopefully when the jails open, we can expand to get back into the jails, but we are going to continue to do that work in those locations as well. Further questions? Does that get into the weeds, I think? Enough. If we could just for a moment have them describe what the average person sees when they interact with Aspire. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so when a inmate um, they send a kite, um, which is a inter jail um, letter or correspondence, right, to administration in the jail, indicating that they want to attend GED programming. Um, then they are put on a list to go through our orientation. That's when they get introduced to our program, we're giving them assessment. It's called the Test of Adult Basic Education or the TABE test. Um, and that gives us a score to kind of identify where the students are. With students, of course, are separated by gender in the Cuyahoga County Jail. They're separated by men and then women. We hold four classes per week for men. This is, of course, prior to COVID and what we hope to get back to or expand beyond. And we held two classes per week for women. Um, so after students enter into our orientation, they're then placed into a class based on their level. So they are put in cohorts based on whatever level it is that they came in at, at their reading level and mathematics. So students then attend class. Um, again, we have orientation monthly, so we can bring in new students whenever they come into the jails. Um, we provide GED testing and exams inside the facility. We actually have an offline testing facility. So students can actually enter into our program attend our classes and take the actual GED exam while they're there. Past the entirety of the test, we actually have graduation ceremonies as well. We've done that three times over the course of the last contract before COVID hit. Um, and then we can send them back out into the world, into the community, connect them with our workforce development program here at Cuyahoga County Public Library, um, and hopefully get them employment based on the now GED that they now have. Thanks, good question. Uh, my question is, you know, at least in theory, our jail's gonna be holding uh, people on a short term, at least in theory. Is there enough time to actually get them from when they get in to actually get their GED? That is an excellent question. So here's an interesting point. So when, when it comes to our GED or adult education program, so we're funded by the state as well, not necessarily the corrections program, but Aspire itself comes from the Ohio Department of Higher Education. So we get our credentials from them. We get our um, procedures and policies from the state. Um, and so therefore, because the state says this is how many hours or this is how much class time a student has to have, it makes it very difficult because as you say, in the Cuyahoga County Jail, they have a very short length of stay, right? So what we're able to do in the jails, for one, we're able to have very immersive classrooms. We were able to have an actual pod, a whole housing unit for the men specifically, where they were actually all together. So all the GED students were together in one housing unit. So they were able to continue their education while the teachers were not necessarily there. So that helped, right? They were given a lot of homework. They were each given textbooks, right? Um, and what we found is when students are in that kind of environment, they move faster through the program than they do if they're in the community, right? And we've actually seen that within our own program because we do have community sites as well. Um, as well as once they come into our program, while they're incarcerated, they can then, once they leave, they can attend programming anywhere that we have programming throughout Cuyahoga County. And because we're Cuyahoga County Public Library, we're in almost all of our 27, or we have options to have class in all of our 27 library branches, as well as community sites throughout Cuyahoga County. So that allows for students that do come in and let's say they only have one of those, you know, the average of 27 days or whatever that minimum is of them staying within the Cuyahoga County Jail, that they've already started the process. So then they're linked up with their instructor, they're linked up with our organization, and they're able to transition into those almost into those other classes almost seamlessly. How does that go? Um, what's the rate of completion so, after 
the student leaves. So after, so we've had a much better rate of student completing the program while they're actually there, right? Because once they leave, then we have all of these other barriers. So we've actually done a lot of work in trying to create um, a, a corrections education transition plan. We actually hired a consultant back in 20, I think it was the end of 2018, and did this work all throughout 2019 um, to kind of try to get all of the stakeholders within, you know, reentry work to make sure that those barriers are kind of are alleviated, right? So that folks that are entering into our program and then they leave really quickly, that they're able to link up with our programming. So that's how we got um, this really interesting and strong partnership with Cuyahoga County Probation. So that when students are on probation, and I keep calling them students, so when students are on probation and they're released from the jail, right, that their probation officer knows who to contact and they're able to then immediately send them to us, as well as being linked up with places like North Star Reentry. So most of them, when they're on probation, are also referred to those locations as well for all the resources that are there, and we are there as well three days a week. But I think that that helps. But the rate, of course, is low, right? Any of those students that are coming out of corrections, it is always a really low rate of getting them linked up to continuing programming once they leave. They're always really gung-ho inside the facility. Yeah, interesting. Okay, thank you for all your work. Any questions? If not, um, I will grant the same consideration of a motion to have resolution 0281 um, move to the next full council meeting with a recommendation of passage under suspension. Thank you. Second reading suspension. Second. Do we have one? Second. All right. Councilwoman <laughs> Turner. Um, thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay? Okay. No, we'd like to hear back from you maybe before, you know, maybe next year to get see how things are going. Okay, thank you. All right, I do not have miscellaneous business except you'll be hearing in this committee in a program that I'm looking into um, to expand our mandated charter um, education programming at the county. So we'll be hearing about a new program and other than that, have a good, um, we'll see at the next full council with all these contracts. <laughs>